Welcome to another episode of our personal empowerment audio program, Finding Yourself in Paradise. Hi, I'm Michael Benner. And I'm Steve Snyder. And our program today is called Teaching Children. This is about helping children understand themselves, understanding their thoughts and their feelings and how they best learn. This is a show to help parents and teachers and mentors and older siblings work with younger children and teach them about the most important subject there is, teaching them about themselves. We've got some great skill sets that we're going to share with you in this program. And there's so much more, of course. This is just an overview. But I think you're going to understand the key principle that we hang this on, which is the idea of changing gears to a special place we can go to learn in both understanding and comprehension or receptive side, so to speak, and in terms of mental rehearsal, an accelerated learning level of mind that draws upon imagination as well as logic and stimulates all aspects of the brain. There's research, in fact, now that shows that this level of thinking, which comes rather natural to children, actually accelerates brain growth. Not only the proliferation of capillaries and neurons, but actual gray matter. The brain itself is bigger in children who are encouraged to think in this natural way. So part of this is we want to encourage a child's natural curiosity. Their desire to learn is hardwired. We just want to get out of the way in that regard and Make sure that we can reinforce and encourage them to be inquisitive and curious. That's interest. That's motivation in the adult world. And so that's natural. Then we give them some learning skills, like this changing gears idea we're going to talk about today, and your child's off and running. So in dealing with little children, one of the most important things to do is to continue to stimulate their curiosity, to continue to stimulate their interest, and that's through exposure and stimulus. I mean, you give them lots of colors and lots of things to touch and lots of things to talk and hear and learn and do, and and allow the child to express its natural curiosity toward the things that it likes more and away from the things it likes less, and then you add more of what it likes more of and take away some of the things that it likes less of and let the child teach you about itself by what where its interests lie. So what we need to do is observe our children in their natural learning processes and their natural stimulation and how they receive stimulation and where their minds go and where their eyes go and where their attention goes and what keeps their attention longer and then start giving them those sorts of things to stimulate them even more in the littlest of children. Now, once children sort of start to get to the point where they can choose what they want to learn, you know, once they see it get to school and they can start picking things, I think it's real important to to use the same knowledge you have of your child as you've watched them grow and develop to help them get into the schooling or the learning process in school. Whatever it is that they like to watch on television or whatever video or computer games they like to play, you get a sense of what subjects they're interested in. Teach them reading through the subjects they're already interested in. Don't make them read dry, boring things that, that, that evoke no interest in them. You already know what they're interested in. Something's been written about that. Teach them to read through the subjects that they're already fascinated by. Yeah, another great example of that is the student who may seem to have a poor aptitude in math, probably just had some bad experiences early on in math, but really likes sports. Well, let's take this interest in baseball and teach them math and all the skills that you would normally get in an academic sense through statistics and batting averages and earned run averages. And I understand there's a fellow out there that's got a whole new approach to statistics that could be really exciting, challenging some of the conventions of the way statistics have been kept. It's pretty much an accepted convention now that there are learning intelligences seven or eight different ways to learn or types of intelligence in terms of learning. We need to recognize the profile for every child has high aptitude in some areas and, you know, moderate or not so high aptitude in other areas. We can't just test across the board and expect all children to have the same aptitude in the same way at the same age that is so 20th century. We're not educating children for factories anymore. 
doing the same thing in the same way at the same time without thinking. Your children, our children, increasingly are going to contribute to society and earn a living based on thinking for themselves, thinking outside the box, inventing new boxes, and then thinking outside of those boxes. As everything accelerates, the rate of acceleration is accelerating in all areas, science and technology and the problems that we face as a society that explodes upon the face of the earth. There are just so many great challenges We can exploit, in the best sense of that word, these natural intelligences if we recognize that they are multiple, not just one IQ. Yeah, I think the greatest shift in teaching children in the 21st century is that we now recognize one size doesn't fit all anymore, that we need to teach children the way they learn. In fact, let's go back to one of the most basic things that we succeed at in some cases and fail miserably at in other cases, and that's the basics of teaching children how to read. You know, we introduce children how to read, generally speaking, with one particular method. We teach all the kids one way, and that one way has gone back and forth over the years between the two basic kinds of ways, the visual way and the auditory way. The visual way is the whole whole brain learning. The You see the word on the flashcard, and you get a picture of what the whole word looks like. And the auditory way is the phonics, the phonetics, the sound it out, the make the noise that the letters make. Well, you know, they both work for some kids better than for other kids, and, and the key is to identify which would be better for your kid. Now, that's an easy thing to do. It's easy to identify in your children whether they're more visual or whether they're more auditory. It's easy to identify because if you listen to them talk to you, they will tell you whether they're more visual or more auditory. If they're more visual, they'll tell you things like, oh, I see what you mean, or yeah, I get the picture, or that looks good to me. And if they're auditory, they'll be saying things like, oh, I hear you, or that rings a bell, or that sounds good to me. Listen to the words they use, and they'll tell you how their minds work. So if kids are talking and saying things about what they're seeing in their minds, then teach them to read through seeing in their mind. And if they're telling you that they're hearing a voice, their voice, talking to themselves in their mind, and they're hearing the words and the sounds of the words, then they're telling you that that's how they learn. If they like to sing the songs that they hear, you know, they're more auditory. If they like to point out the pictures they see, they're more visual. Pay attention to your children, and they will give you a really good clue as to which way they learn. And then, of course, we have to also deal with that small percentage of kids who are kinesthetic that don't particularly exhibit great skills in visual or auditory learning, but they still can be taught to read in a more kinesthetic method by teaching them to draw the letters or to build the letters in, out of sand or out of clay by giving them a physical way of taking notes while they later when they learn to read. We can involve every child and make every child a great reader. The problem is this one-size-fits-all leaves many children behind. You can test yourself or test your kids or your friends easily. Just ask someone playfully, hey, when I say the following word, uh, tell me what happens, what your response is. When I say the word bell, and then wait a moment, and then ask them, so did you see a bell in your mind's eye? Did you hear a bell? Or did you just feel a bell, like a big gong or a church bell in your body resonating somehow? Just sort of know what a bell is. Yeah, so. yeah there's that too, yeah. ascension, so yeah. what, what is bell? Yeah. And most people will be able to tell you quite easily. And then repeat the experiment. Say, um, train. Did you see a picture of a train? Did you hear the train? Chick, 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 and the woo. Or did you just feel maybe what it might be like to be riding on the train, bouncing back and forth? Well, these are representational systems. They're sometimes simply called rep systems, and it's a way of looking at the world, organizing the world. So children, adults too, for that matter, have, in most cases, a primary rep system that they rely on, but can learn to develop the other two. That's what we all want to do. Now, you combine this idea of these three rep systems with the multiple intelligences, and then this final element we're going to talk about, switching gears, and you have a cutting-edge approach to 21st century accelerated learning. Yeah, what we want to teach children how to do is to get into the mode of learning when it's time to learn. They have different modes they live in their lives. There's their playground mode where they're exuberant and playful and out there. And then there's their, Michael, you called it the classroom mode, I guess, or or the indoor mode for some kids. It's where, you know, you... Or the dinner table. Yeah, okay, you use that indoor voice. You don't, you don't, you know, squirm around and, you know... 
And, and we're saying that's a, that's a shifting gears that takes place when kids say, okay, it's time to come in from play and to sit down at the dinner table. Or it's time to come in from recess and sit down in the classroom. You have to shift gears. Well, we're suggesting that you need to teach children to shift gears one more time from there. And that takes them out of the classroom mode into an even deeper learning mode where they go and switch gears and go inside their own minds. We all know the experience of having dozens of ideas competing for our attention at the same time. It's been compared to a monkey house. Saw all these monkeys screeching at the same time. Doesn't it feel like that sometimes? I mean, Steve talked about multitasking or an attempt to do several things at the same time, but the point is the more stimulated and stressed we become, And the longer we live that kind of high-anxiety lifestyle, the more voices we have in our heads, and the louder and more demanding, the more insistent those voices become. Well, make no mistake about it, in this day and age, children have this same situation. Overstimulated, highly stressed in most cases, lots of anxiety, And it really helps them to know that when they come in from outside, where in most cases they're allowed to be exuberant and jump around and happy and laugh out loud and have fun, put on that indoor voice, that composure to be a little more quiet now, lower your energy, be a little more respectful. Now do it again. Close your eyes and breathe and relax And use the sensory imagination, not only visualization, but to the students you do narratives around a learning subject that include imagine how that would sound, imagine how that would smell, how it would taste, how it would feel. I'll bet you could imagine reaching out and touching that thing. For example... Remember the story problems we used to have in junior high school? Boy, I I always thought those were tough. Somebody leaves a train station A in one direction at so many miles an hour, and somebody else leaves the train station B in a different direction, and one of the trains collide, and you have to do that algebra. Imagine the ability to empathize, to be on the train, or a history lesson where A teacher gives you a two-minute exercise or maybe three minutes where they just close their eyes and imagine being on that Conestoga wagon, right? And experience deeply and richly pulling on all aspects of the imagination. For every physical sense, you see, there is an imaginary sense. And this just enriches and enhances the learning experience. So what we need to understand about children is that they learn best when they're in this particular state we're talking about where they switch gears out of their outdoor voice and outdoor behavior into that indoor dinner table or classroom behavior and one more time, even quieter, into this what is actually the alpha brainwave state. Out of that multitasking or divided attention state where they're looking at things and hearing things and paying attention to all that stuff going on outside their lives and it's time to even slow down a bit more by switching gears one more time. And that starts, that always starts with one really slow, deep breath. That's the key. It's working with children is you have to get them to stop and take one slow, deep breath. Once you've done that, the gears have changed. Once you've got their attention. Now, you don't always get their attention when you want their attention with little kids. Sometimes you have to wait until they're ready to pay attention to you. But You can evoke their attention. You can be interesting and make them want to pay attention to whatever it is you're doing. But when you do have their attention, you've gotten their attention, you need them to switch gears. And that starts with taking one slow, purposeful breath, following your direction. Now you've got them following your direction. Then you get them to close their eyes. And here's the most important tool, I think, in working with children, the most important tool. We call it mental rehearsal or sensory imagination or visualization or conceptualization, but basically getting them to picture, to imagine, to hear, to feel, to experience in their imagination, in their minds, 
what you want them to learn. I think every class that any teacher teaches should begin with a few minutes of closing your eyes and taking the kids to a place where you introduce them to what you're going to teach them today. Tell them what you're going to tell them. And then every class should end with a couple few minutes where you have them close their eyes and take that deep breath and go back and tell them what you told them. Every lesson a parent teaches a child should begin the same way. You want to teach a child about being safe and not running out into the street but staying on the sidewalk? What you want to staying on the front yard, what you want them to do is close their eyes and imagine themselves doing what you want them to do. It makes it much more powerful. You see, children's minds are much more absorbed by pictures and movement, but mental pictures and mental movement is just as powerful as real pictures and real movement. With the eyes closed, imagining moving and imagining seeing things is just as powerful to the mind, stimulates the mind. So we need to stimulate children's minds with their eyes closed by getting them to imagine learning the things that we are going to introduce them to. Here's another great idea for parents and teachers and others to, again, promote this whole idea of accelerated learning. Lead a discussion of why it's important to know this particular lesson or this particular topic, this subject area, whatever the case may be. Why do you think this is important? Why do you think it's relevant? That's not too big a word for a grade school kid, although their sense of relevance is going to be a lot smaller than someone in junior high school or high school as their world expands. So you allow for that. But, hey, why is this important? Or why do you find this interesting? You know, children are often portrayed as asking, why, mommy, why, why, daddy, why? Turn it around. Ask them, why? Do you think we want you to learn this? Why do you think all these people spent all these hours writing this book so that you could learn this subject, right? I mean, it's one thing to say you don't like broccoli. It's another thing to say you don't like this subject when you don't know anything about it. So what do you think might be interesting? A little bit of conversation along those lines can go a long way. I think that's an important part of learning anything. It's it's easy to learn something when you're interested. And what you need to do, of course, is expose your children to a lot of things so that you can discover what they're interested in and then give them more and more of that. But sometimes you have to give them things they're not interested in. And in that case, you need to get them to be interested in it. And there's a specific methodology to do that. I mean, there's a way of getting kids interested in things. Advertisers know all about it. You know, every, every Christmas season, somebody figures out some great way to get kids interested in some new thing. So what we need to do is use psychology psychology use parenting skills to uh, use teaching skills to get kids to be interested in subject matter now What's really important, I think, is to have a method to do that. Is that don't just hope it happens. You know, have a, a way of making that happen. And I think kids need to be exposed to a specific methodology of how to study, how to learn things. And it really breaks down to six easy steps. The first thing you need to do is expose the children to the material. Uh, let them tell them what you're going to tell them. Give them the uh, basic idea. If they're going to read something, let them look at the pages for a few moments to just expose their eye to the key words that pop into their head. Get them thinking about it. Get them off of whatever else. They they were doing on to this. That's the first thing you have to do. And of course, remember, it all starts by it's time to learn now. So let's switch gears. Let's close your eyes and take a deep breath. <sighs> Move to that inside yourself place. And now it's time to learn. So introduce them to the material or let them introduce themselves to the material. And then what you were just talking about, get them interested. If they're if they're already interested, get into get in touch with the interest they're feeling. If they're not, give them the opportunity to create interest. And the way you create interest in something is by imagining some reward you're going to get for learning it. Imagining that if I learn this, this wonderful thing is going to happen. It doesn't even have to be possible. It doesn't have to be realistic. It can be, but it just has to feel good. And by imagining something that feels good that you will get by doing this, the mind moves toward what it feels good and moves away from what feels bad. And if it thinks it feels good to learn this, it'll want to learn this. There's no such thing as something interesting or boring. There are people that are interested and people that are bored. So we teach kids to, to get interested in subjects by imagining something wonderful associated with it. Use your imagination, let them use theirs. Once they've gotten that interest peaked and they're feeling interested in something, they can imagine something they're already interested in and get what that feels like and then switch it over. There's lots of ways to do that. But once they're feeling the interest, then you have them read or you teach them the stuff. You tell them information. You get them exposed to the stuff. And and you do that 
as long as they're paying attention, ideally for the duration of their attention span, which is variable, but when their eyes glaze over, when they, their mind wanders away, then it's time to stop. The best way to teach children is when they're paying attention, and when they stop paying attention, stop teaching. But understand that the coolest thing about attention spans, whether they're really short or really, really long, is they have amazingly rapid recovery rates. I mean, just a few moments and the kid's ready to pay attention again. You just can't pay attention for five minutes. Maybe you do two minutes on, ten seconds off, two minutes on, ten seconds off. So they all have a an amount of time they can pay attention. It varies. But when their mind goes away, when their eyes drift away from you, or when their eyes drift away from the book, or they're staring at this one word, you can watch, you can observe. They've stopped paying attention. Well, then create a break. And then you can go back. The key is not create a longer attention span. It's to take however long the attention span is and put it back to back to back. So you take in the information, and then the fourth step is you have them go back to that switch gears place, close their eyes, go to that deep breath, relax, feel safe and peaceful, and then think about what they just learned. Just let it gestate. Let it, let it evolve inside their minds. Let, it, let their mind go to thinking about what it means and what they could do with it. And, and then finally... After they feel like they have a sense of it, it feels familiar to them, they open their eyes and they go over it again. You, you, you review it for them or they read it again they, real fast just to sort of remind themselves of it. And then finally, they see themselves back in that switched gears place using the information, mentally rehearsing the output, seeing themselves take the test or seeing themselves build that car or whatever it is they're learning to do, see themselves actually doing that thing that they're learning about. So number one, you warm up the mind. You preview the information. Number two is you warm up the heart. You get interested in the information. Number three is you take in the information for as long as your attention span and take a break, very short, and then move on to the next attention span. Number four is you review the information in your mind. Number five is you go back over the information, reviewing it in actuality or scanning back over it again. And number six is you mentally rehearse using that information in your life. So what you have with Steve's six-part study program here is this gear shifting we're talking about every other step, where you go into the alpha brainwave level, you teach the child how to do this. It's going to be easy and fun for them to do. Steps two, four, and six. And then in each case, that's followed by opening their, their eyes and doing the next step of the study process. Then they internalize that. And you go back and forth and back and forth. Now you're using all aspects of the brain. Again, we could simplify this and talk about the left brain and the right brain are involved, or the frontal lobe and the mammalian brain are involved. The truth is that the cutting-edge brain research on this is so complex that probably the best thing that we can say is that when you encourage and even train children to do this Elegant, after a while it gets really graceful, gear changing as we're calling it, going back and forth from the closed eye rehearsal to the open eye performance, that you're using the whole brain and the whole mind. That's probably the best we can say is that it's inclusive. Everything seems to be working. Maybe most natural way to learn is another good way to say it. Yeah, so what we're introducing children to is a whole new way to learn. They know about their outdoor way to be and their indoor classroom or dinner table way to be. This is another way to be. It's a way of closing their eyes, taking a deep breath, and going into a place in between sleep and awake, uh, a daydream-like state that they're in frequently in their lives, but this is spacing in instead of spacing out. This is intentional and purposeful, and we can help them switch gears as a part of their learning process. So whenever it's time to learn, they know that part of the learning process involves this switching gears. So what they do is they literally slow down their brainwave activity. Now, how do you do that? Well, it's really very simple. What you do is you help children fall just a little bit of the way to sleep. And the way you do that is you encourage them to breathe slower and deeper and to close their eyes and to daydream. And so one of my favorite exercises to work with with children, because they can use this one their whole lives. I started doing this when I was eight years old. Uh, It's never too early to teach children how to imagine and visualize and use their mind's eye to create. I created in my mind something that was so helpful all my life, something I call the learning lab or a learning laboratory, Uh, a a place where I could go in my mind. It had this very special chair that was built just for me, and it had all these, like, Star Trek kind of... 
controls and consoles and stuff, and this big, beautiful screen that came down. It used to be like a movie screen, then it, it turned into this like uh, three-dimensional hologram thing, but of, of whatever it is I wanted to rehearse, of seeing myself take the test, or seeing myself uh, hitting a home run, or seeing myself like playing that great riff on the guitar, or whatever it is I wanted to learn how to do, I would imagine myself in this learning lab where there are no distractions and there's no interruptions, and any time I wanted to learn, I go to this learning lab, and I imagine myself in that learning lab being a great learner. And the lighting is perfect, and it smells wonderful, and it feels so good in there. The temperature's perfect. It's just, it's just such a perfect, perfect environment for me to learn anything that I want to learn. This is why we say learning is fun. Natural learning is fun, because you learn the stuff that, for you, is fun. Encourage a child to do that by allowing them, even encouraging them, to shift gears, to close eyes, and to go into creative daydreaming is not spacing out. Mental rehearsal is not, you know, some ethereal, blue sky, airy-fairy place. It is using the power of the imagination to accelerate learning. One of the most knowledgeable people of the 20th century, Albert Einstein, said imagination is more important than knowledge. Now, others have said that in different ways, but coming from Einstein, (laughs) if he says imagination is more important than knowledge, that you understand imagination is a bedrock of learning, not just for pretending and making stuff up, but for really being able to get all of the intelligences and all of the rep systems in line with a natural passion and a feeling of, I love to learn. I'm not sure what your experience was, but I remember in the first grade when the teacher set up those three reading groups. And I think so that we wouldn't know who was in what group. They were the red, blue, green group or something like that. But what I remember strongly was the feeling of, all right, I'm in the good group. I'm in the great group. And then looking at others, I'm like six years old, and I'm judging these kids as inferior, right? Talk about feeding my ego. The only thing I was good at was reading out loud. That didn't mean that this classmate of mine who's in the poor reading group, oh, they called it the yellow group, but he figured it out pretty quickly. His aptitude might have been in mathematics. This, this, this might be somebody with a cure for cancer. But because they were put in the third reading group, their education, their lives became a self-fulfilling prophecy. And they never did take that class in self-esteem or self-confidence They were never exposed to the ideas we're talking about that everybody is intelligent in their own way. Sort of like that song, everybody's beautiful in their own way. Well, we're all intelligent. We all have incredible, magnificent potential. It's a matter of finding it. And when you teach your kids and your students to do this gear-shifting process to access the imagination... Not instead of typical classroom behavior, but in addition to learning is a blast. And again, kids can then focus on what they love to do and what they're best at and get special attention in other essential areas if they don't have a natural potential. So everybody wins. And this is 21st century education. It accelerates the learning process. And one way to think of this is Early in the program, we talked about multitasking, and I was describing also ideas competing for your attention. Well, if you have, let's say, six voices competing for your attention inside your head, or six pictures that are demanding, look at me, look at me, let's talk about these bills that are unpaid. Oh, no, how are we going to get Jane to flute practice? Yeah, but Bill's got that dental appointment. Oh, our taxes aren't done. Oh, my, and all of this stuff is spinning around in your head. Then any particular thought gets just a fraction of your attention. The idea of shifting gears and going into this alpha brainwave level, pulling on the child's rich imagination, and of course this works for adults too, is that this is a level of concentration. 
This is where your attention is focused. Pay attention is a funny way to say it, but this is concentration. It's a relaxation skill to concentrate. It's not something you try to do. It's not an effort. And it's this natural place where every idea gets the full power of your complete attention. How can that not powerfully accelerate and amplify the learning experience? So the process really is quite simple. We introduce children to this new gear, this shifting to this third gear. They know their outdoor gear. They know their dinner table or classroom gear. Now there's this new gear that they go to by closing their eyes and taking a deep breath and imagining themselves, for example, in this learning laboratory. Imagine themselves in their special place, their Captain Kirk seat, their, their special place where they can be the great learners they want to be with a screen that they can see anything they want to see. Have them imagine or, or invent some other way of imagining themselves in this great learning environment. Starts with that, that switching gears, that process takes just a few seconds, just a deep breath or two and close your eyes and get this picture in their minds that they've had before or just the feeling of being a great learner. And then I think it's really important to understand how sensory imagination and mental rehearsal works. There's really basically four rules you have to obey, four guidelines you got to follow to be able to effectively program your mind. And it's really quite simple. I I make them easier to remember because I, I give them all names that begin with the letter P, four P's of programming your mind. The first thing you have to understand is that you must imagine what you do want because negative suggestions don't work. If you say, don't think of a rainbow, you still think of a rainbow. So You have to imagine what you do want. If you imagine what you don't want, your mind will think you want what you don't want. So you have to imagine what you do want, positive. The second thing you have to do is imagine it as if it's happening right now, present tense. You have to imagine it's happening at this very moment. Not like it's going to happen one day because then it'll always be off in this future thing that never comes to be. I'm going to go on a diet tomorrow and you wake up the next morning and it's not tomorrow yet. It's still today. So I'm going to do it as if it's happening now, positive, present tense. I'm going to do it over and over and over again, repetition, persistence, perseverance, practice. And then, of course, the most important piece of all, I'm going to do it with great passion, with great passion. And if you don't really feel the passion, just pretend you feel the passion because imaginary passion works just as well as real passion. So the four Ps, positive, imagine what you do want, present tense, imagine it's true now, practice, imagine it over and over and over again, and and imagine it with great passion, real or imaginary. And you know, you don't have to do passion the way I do passion. You don't have to do passion with exuberance and, and enthusiasm like I. You can do passion very quietly by being really confident or totally happy. Any way you do a lot of emotion, that's the key. Imagine what you do want is if you've already got it over and over again with great passion. We'll show you what we're talking about in just a minute here, but I want to speak just for one more minute to those of us who still may be hung up on the word imagination because, well, maybe somewhere along the way we came to understand that it's all fanciful, it's all pretend and made up and doesn't really matter anyway. Imagination is all an illusion or worse yet a delusion and why are you wasting your time? Um, Look at the power of the motion picture. Look at the emotional impact of movies played out as colored light dancing on the wall. Now, your conscious mind knows that it's nothing more than a projection of light from behind you. You sometimes even turn around and look at the projector. You can, when the theater is dark enough, even see a stream, a beam of light coming out of the projector and hitting the screen. You know, it's a time shift. There's editing, and the soundtrack was added, but you paid 12 bucks to get in so, and, and another $18 for that popcorn. So what do you say to the conscious mind? You shift gears, and you allow it to idle over here on the side while you move into the imagination, drawing upon all those imaginary senses and sensations. You allow yourself... I don't want to say you trick yourself because it's deliberate. There's no trick. You allow yourself to be immersed in the imaginary experience of it being real, and it's real enough that it changes people's lives. Movies change people's lives. So don't ever underestimate the power of imagination. And remember, if, if Einstein said it's more important than knowledge, 
That's something to consider. Certainly one of the most knowledgeable people of the 20th century. Einstein said logic will get you from A to B. Imagination will take you everywhere else. Very nice. Let's use the very technique that we're talking about to help you learn the six steps so that you can then be better at teaching your friends, your kids, your students, who knows, maybe even your parents or somebody else, these really valuable skills. Every other one switching gears, going back and forth to these different levels of awareness in a purposeful and deliberate way to use all of the mind. And as we say, accelerate and amplify learning. Why does it work? Because this is natural. This is natural learning. This is allowing children to express who they really are. So it always begins with uh, having children understand now it's time to switch gears. And uh, we understand also it's now time to switch gears. So in switching gears, moving out of our normal waking consciousness into this, I think, uh, more focused passion state, a place of narrow awake instead of wide awake, always begins with the breathing and closing your eyes, cutting out sensory stimulus and having an intention to uh, relax and feel safe. So let's start as we teach our children to do this, we guide them by asking them to first close their eyes and then take one real slow, deep, deep breath. And as they release, and as you release, imagine something that makes you feel at peace. Whether you're practicing this for your own benefit or doing a simple narrative for others. If it's a child, you want to use something they can relate to. To imagine relaxation being like, um, oh, a snowman slowly melting in the springtime, watching. And you do this in your narrative, little drips of moisture until the one piece of coal that's the left eye falls out and the nose made out of a carrot falls and then leave some spaces in your narrative some empty spaces for the child to participate in this softening this letting go idea or you could suggest something like uh, how it feels or how it might feel to be like a stick of butter left out on the countertop on a on a warm day slowly softening just feel the softening in your body so the process is really simple it starts with telling children it's now time to shift gears you have them sit down and close their eyes and take a real deep breath and as they release that breath you have them engage their imagination. A peaceful place or a learning laboratory or a special memory. Have them engage in something that is easy to imagine and feels good. And then in that state, the first step is you expose them to the information. Introduce and preview what's to come. Get the mind warmed up. That's how it starts. That's step number one. And so step number two, we switch gears. We come to this place. We're already here. And this is where you imagine yourself interested. Or you remember why it makes perfect sense to be interested. Why you've always been interested. Or why you're considering that there might be something interesting in this material you need to read, but eh, really don't want to read. And you pretend being interested. You consider that there might be some great reward or benefit. Even a round of applause when you're done would do for me a feeling of being a winner just because you read the material. Use the imagination to play carrot and stick. Dream up the reward. Subconscious will go for it. Get interested. Move your awareness, if you wish, 
into the area of your heart or just below the heart and imagine the aspiration and how good it'll feel to learn this new information. The next step is to read. We open our eyes and we read the material. Now, we read for as long as it feels comfortable to read, for as long as our attention span allows us to read. And when our attention span stops or our mind wanders, we stop, close our eyes, relax for a moment or two, and then begin with a new attention span. Instead of trying to create a longer attention span, we simply put our, however long our attention span is, we put our attention spans back to back to back with short little breaks. So the second step is to read. Now read without judgment. Read without figuring out what it means to you or what ramifications it's going to have later. Just take in the data. There'll be time to think about it, to decide what it means and how it affects you later. This step is just taking in the information, just reading for as long as your mind is paying attention. And then we move into step four, which is shifting gears again. Take a breath, exhale, come back to this place. We're already here now, but come back to this place now. Even if only for 30 seconds, maybe a minute, and rest your eyeballs. If you'd like to think about what you read, you could. But you're going to be doing that in a minute in step five, the the study part of this in your normal classroom consciousness. Right now, what I'd suggest you do while you rest those eyeballs is think of anything but learning. Take your mind and your heart on a little mini vacation for 30 seconds or a minute. Think of beautiful memories, great times, beauty, Love, peace, harmony, freedom, childhood. And it also helps, according to research, if we think of the blackest black we can consider, like a black satin or a black velvet or some remote corner of the universe with no more stars in it. That, for just a few seconds really refreshes the rods and cones and the eyeballs as we prepare to open our eyes and shift gears again. In this next step, it's time to really study. It's time to really get what we've read. So we go back over what we read very fast over what we already knew, very fast over what we got the first time through, and very fast over what we don't need and what we can forget. And we carefully study what we still need to get. We carefully study the material that when we read it the first time, we realized this is important and I need to know it. Step five is review very fast over most of the material and carefully study what you still need to learn. And lastly, step six, here we go. Take a nice, slow, deep breath. We're going to shift gears again to this place of mental rehearsal for review, where you can not only review in your mind the material that you know, in step six, you can review how it feels to know that you know it. You can imagine yourself even taking the test. And the beauty of sensory imagination in these levels of mind as we come back here for step six. And you can do this now, is imagine yourself taking the test as if you were outside of yourself and across the room, and there you see yourself over there taking the test, and Well, there's a smile on your face, and you seem so relaxed, and you're moving right through the test in what appears to be a very confident way, and you begin to get excited. The feeling you're just making this up is exactly the right feeling. Now you can move inside your body and feel how it feels to know that you know 
and you're doing really well on the tests. There, there was one or two you weren't sure of. You skip those. You're going to go back if time permits, because you know how to do multiple choice exams. Mostly, you just love the feeling of knowing what you're doing as you take this test. You imagine handing it in, and you can even imagine finding out that indeed you did really, really well on the test. You got the score you wanted. You exceeded the score you wanted. You got a big A on the test, whatever is an appropriate result for you. Allow yourself to experience, to rehearse, mentally and emotionally, with focus and with passion, how wonderful it feels to learn, to understand, and to express, to demonstrate the proof of that understanding. So therein lies the six-part study skills plan. Therein is the way from first exposing the child to the material to the time that they regurgitate it on the test or tell you about it or share it with their friends. How to intake, process, and output information all using this process of shifting gears for steps two, four, and six into this focused passion alpha brainwave state. And when they're reading, make sure they've listened to the Family Learning Hour program on accelerated reading that introduces them to this incredible trifocus reading technique. We've got programs on reading, study, memory, and test taking to expand on this accelerated learning information. So step one, is to expose yourself to the material. Step two is to create interest. Step three is to read and take it in. Step four is to allow yourself to relax and allow that information to process. Step five is review, and step six is mentally rehearse the outcome, the test, the result. It's a step-by-step process using this amazing technique of shifting gears. Now, just before we suggest that you open your eyes, wide awake, alert, rested and refreshed and back in the room. We'd like you to consider how it feels to be able to share these skills with others. Your own kids, students that you have access to, friends and neighbors making copies of this program and passing it on, giving it away. That's fine with us. This is not copyrighted in this form. Pass it on. Pay it forward. Let everybody know the good news, right? How's that going to feel? To know that you are making a difference in your own life with these skills and these tools, but in the lives of your kids, the tools they need. Everyone seems to know there's something very archaic and outdated about keeping children in classrooms based only upon their age and promoting them largely for social reasons, regardless of academic performance. We've got to find new and better ways to encourage children to want to learn, to tap into that natural passion. And you're feeling it right now. So tell yourself that you can, without any effort whatsoever, bring with you this enthusiasm, this joy, this sense of fulfillment as a learner who now has something to teach others that they might be better and better at learning for the 21st century and beyond. Take a nice, slow, deep breath. Hold as you peek and sense the fullness, and as you exhale, uh, open your eyes, wide awake, alert, rested, and refreshed, feeling fine. Feeling fine, and having a way of teaching your children that uh, is easily implementable in your life with your own kids or with the kids that you teach. It's most important that children understand this new gear. You know, there's the outdoor gear, there's the classroom or dinner table gear, and now there's this new gear they get to learn where they get to close their eyes and go inside themselves and move into this focused passion alpha state. Make sure that they listen to the Family Learning Hour programs. You might want to check out the one on the gentle overthrow of the school system to see what's possible for the future as well. But most important of all, take responsibility for giving your children the best head start they could possibly have. Teach them in early childhood how to be great learners. And as always, be gentle, love life, and take care of each other. For Steve Snyder, this is Michael Benner. 
Aloha from Maui. <laughs> 